Hello and good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, or whatever time you're watching this. But where I am, it is morning. I am so glad to bring you this chat with uh, Carl Monaghan this morning. Um, it's something I've been wanting to do for quite a while. Carl and I met online uh, a couple of years ago and we, we've chatted a lot about our approaches to pelvic pain and pelvic health, um, specifically with men. And uh, he's a bit of a visionary. He's a, a really, really genuinely wonderful man, which you'll, you'll see from this um, film. But he's he's very um, he, his work is evidence based, and he's really good at drawing in the evidence and drawing in the research that we have, and forming a really holistic, a truly holistic in the in the most evidence based sense of the word um, vision of how we can serve men better. And he's doing that in everything he does. So Carl works from the Pelvic Pain Clinic. Um, in uh, Islington in London um, and I'll put a couple of links to hear how you can get hold of Carl below this video. He also, um, so he treats men with pelvic pain, um, chronic prostatitis, um, chronic complex pain, any kind of pain that you want to talk about in men, Carl treats, um, and occasionally a woman but mostly men. Um, he runs a fantastic support group as well online where men can get together and there are experts in situ and you can have really good open conversations to support each other about your pelvic pain. So if that's something that you're interested in or you feel that like you need to be able to talk to someone, an online space is just incredibly friendly and supportive and evidence-based and um, helpful. Because um, often it's really hard to talk about these things. So we don't talk about male pelvic pain enough. Men have pelvises. <laughs> they get pain as well. And it is something that we can treat and we can change. Men can get better from pelvic pain. But you have to be able to talk about it first and know that knowing that there's, there's other people out there going through the same thing and that there is treatment available can be really helpful. So this one is for therapists, for physios, for all kinds of therapists um, that are treating male pelvic pain, but it's also for patients. Um, remember this isn't uh, an adjunct for medical advice, you need to go and see your doctor and that's where your conversation should start if you've had any pain at all. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's prostate cancer, a lot of people are terrified that it's prostate cancer. Just go see your GP, start that conversation, have the tests done, and when the tests are done, go see someone that can help you. And often getting in touch with Carl or having a search online for male pelvic health or pelvic pain physios or even women's health physios, often treat um, men as well, you'll find people that might be able to guide you in the right direction. So Carl is a... Um, He's many things. We tried to describe and define him and it's a, it's a bit difficult from a job role point of view. Um, he comes from a sports massage and, and therapy point background, but he's also a qualified teacher and he's also an ex-pelvic um, pain sufferer himself. So he innately knows what you're going through, um, which gives him a really, really good viewpoint um, and I think makes him a really better human. He has rehabbed himself and recovered from this, so he, he knows exactly the journey that you're going on. Um, and also from a therapy point of view, it really gives them a very good viewpoint as to how um, implementing the evidence-based approach can be difficult, but also how we can do that. So without further ado, I'll bring you the chat with Carl. Um, I don't know if I've already said we were in a hotel um, lobby. I think I have. Um, but bear with the choppiness of the cuts. It's just that we uh, had... We really wanted to get this chat done and it's the only time we had together was at Lauren Mimosley's recent uh, weekend conference. Um, so the only place we had to do it was in the hotel lobby, so bear with us. Um, hopefully you enjoy this and you'll get a lot out of it. I'll put all of the links to things that are um, underneath this blog. If you're looking on YouTube then make sure you head over to my website where all of there'll be a full blog about this episode with more links and more information. Um, and without further ado, if you've got pelvic pain or you're suffering, please go see someone. Get in touch with your local GP, your doctor, your consultant, whoever it needs to be. Um, and this can change and you can be get better. And those of you treating pelvic pain in men, carry on, fantastic, let's chat more, get in touch with me on Twitter, on Facebook, via my blog, sign up for the newsletter which will be down the bottom um, where we talk about more of these things more often and I put up regular vlogs um, with experts in their field when I come across them um, regularly. Okay, enjoy. Hello everyone, I am here with the fantastic Carl Monaghan who is a um, pelvic pain specialist, sports and massage therapist originally. Kind of all gets a bit blurred, had this yeah. conversation a few times today, what, what, where are my origins? But yeah, originally sports massage therapist, mm -hmm. advanced clinical massage therapy, and then you start doing more research, more training, and your role starts to become a little bit more blurred. 
I think it's very easy to be defined by our qualifications, but actually who we are as practitioners, who we are as therapists, changes. Yeah. And the more we understand about our patients, the more we understand around pain and the presentations we treat, then again our roles kind of change. I heard a um, therapist recently describe, so she, she was originally a chiropractor, describe herself as a coach mm. That's in, nice. in pain. I thought that, that kind of yeah. summed up very much the line of what, what, I, what I do and what you do as well. Yeah, I think we work in um, very similar ways Definitely. from what I've, what I've seen and what we've talked over the years. Mm. Um, because Carl, for those of you, um, you may not be aware of Carl, lots of people are aware of Carl, um, you really kind of come to the fore in the male pelvic health, pelvic pain sphere. Um, and we've, uh, we've interacted in lots of conferences and, and courses and we've come across each other lots of ways with, um, in, in, in different forums in that area. So I think mm. it is really hard to define you because you, <laughs> you kind of, um, in the same way that I think my own scope has changed, mm -hmm. we're, within physio obviously because we're CSP registered we have to be very careful to stay within our scope. Um, but within that there are areas that grow and, and change so certainly like the coaching side mm. um, almost the supportive and emotional understanding the psychosexual areas of yeah. physiotherapy I've, I've kind of branched out into the last four or five years and I think you encompass all of that um, so put an apron on you is really hard it is difficult isn't it and yeah. I don't like in the same way I don't like diagnoses yeah. because they can blur the lines specifically mm. in, in men's health men's pelvic pain um, <clears throat> if you get pigeonholed as a particular type of therapist, yeah. then you're treated like that. And I often get asked, am I a physio? And when I say I'm not, sometimes it can draw blank looks or well, how have you gotten into this? How are you yeah. working with this patient population? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an expanding area. Men do have pelvises. Men do have pelvic Men floors. Have I pelvic know, it's floors. crazy, isn't it? Dr. Oz, pay attention. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We need, we need more people talking about men. So being that you just mentioned it, how did you get into it? Uh, good question. So, um, in my mid twenties, I had pelvic pain myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Had a massive infection, lost a testicle. So I had an epididymo or chitis. So the epididymis oh. is a series of tubes that sit around the testicle that became infected, and the testicle itself also became infected. Mm -hmm. Grew to the size of about a grapefruit, and then shrunk down to another gristle. Ooh. So I, I'm I'm one ball down at the moment. There was a, um, there was a famous still song effective, around. Though. Still effective. Still effective. Yeah. Uh, have a young boy, have another child on the way as well. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the things are definitely working down Yeah, there. just for everyone that knows yeah. that when you lose a testicle, it's okay. Things it's okay. Work. And I, I have nothing to do with the song that was made up around a certain German dictator back in the 40s. Yeah, nothing to do. We won't, we won't touch on. Yeah. So I had personal experience myself, yeah. um, working at the Prostate Centre, Wimpole Street, um, about 10 years ago. Um, I realised there was a niche, uh, mm -hmm. so I realised there was a hole and a gap in practice mm -hmm. for men suffering with these type of symptoms. Massive, massive hole, but still there. Completely, and I'm not sure, you know, it's going to take an awful lot to change some of that doctrine, some of that current mm -hmm. approach, um, which is exciting, you yeah. know, to be at that at the beginnings and, and, and to help some of these things as well. Definitely, much nicer okay. to be on the wave, surfing yeah. the wave as well, that's a, that's a nice place to be. Yeah. They treated prostate cancer exceptionally well. Yeah. <clears throat> they treated BPH or the benign swelling of the prostate exceptionally well. But where, where I felt um, there was a gap was when they came to treating patients who had um, diagnoses of prostatitis or, mm. or chronic pelvic pain syndrome, as it's also known as. And just the methodology that was used with patients didn't sit well. Because I've, I know what they were going through, it didn't sit well with me. And I started to realise that the approach they were using, although gave benefit to some patients, that was good, there was an awful lot of patients that were walking away from there not, not feeling listened to, ending up in more pain, um, not being understood, and, and the patient just got very confused and, and quite angry and just upset sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So have you, I mean obviously you're now in practice and you're, you're leading the way for a lot of us really, kind of in, in the ways that you, you've got your um, pelvic pain kind of support groups mm -hmm. um, that are really trying to bridge that, that need for men. Um, but what was your treatment like back in your 20s? Good question. So I had gone into <coughs> A&E on a Sunday night and they discharged me, mm. um, saying it's a twisted testicle, it's nothing to worry about, go back home. And I ended up back in hospital 24 hours later. They were still dismissing me. Yeah. Um, was triaged, so was, um, um, 
was given a series of tests and assessments from the uh, doctor on, on call at the time, and they still weren't very convinced that anything other than just a twisted yeah, testicle, which is a normal uh, medical pre normal yeah, yeah. No, common sure yeah. commonish yeah. Common presentation, um, and then they finally realised actually something is not right here. So I stayed in hospital for four days, and then beyond that, the care was. Mid, like, no care. Did you get any follow-up whatsoever? No. So no one ever kind of rang you and said, go see a physio, go see a, a, a urologist? There was none of that. I had gone yeah. back in, the only appointment I had, and I had concerns in my mid-twenties, I wasn't in a relationship, but I had concerns over my fertility. Mm. You know, I think, understandably. Um, and I went back to see a urologist, and at the time when he said this, I was, I was livid, absolutely furious. Mm. He was saying to me, don't worry about your fertility. Yeah. All right, it's not something that you need to concern yourself with now. What he should have been saying is, I hear that you're worried about fertility, do you uh, want me to discuss this further yeah. and put your mind at rest? That's right. And, and right. so the language we use, yeah. terminology we use as practitioners is essential in terms mm -hmm. of um, bridging that gap with patients, creating that strong therapeutic alliance. Mm -hmm. I felt dismissed at the time. I, I see his rationale and eventually after a little bit of arguing he did give me a uh, a sperm sample pot to take back home. Great. I never used it. I, I kind of came to terms with it and thought, actually, you know what? Yes, I'm living, I'm not in a relationship at the moment. Mm -hmm. Am I worrying about something prematurely mm. that, that I still have plenty of time to recover from and get better? I've got one more testicle. We, they come in twos. A lot of things in the body come in twos for very good Always reason. Got backup. That's right, thankfully yeah. so. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, there was nothing. You know, so I was, I'm now 42 this summer. Um, it's 2019. Um, I was 26 when it happened. Okay. So we're talking 16 years ago. Yeah. Headache in the pelvis, which you, yeah. you may have heard of. Um, and may, yeah, that's right. It was the Bible. It has been the Bible in male pelvic pain. The first edition of that book came out roughly at the same time when I had my symptoms. Yeah. The issue is, internet, 16 years ago, I mean, we had what dial up, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the Smoke days. signals, I know. whatever it was. I know. Yeah. Someone picking up the phone going, get off the internet, I'm going to use the phone. <laughs> yeah. and, and going into a library. Yeah. I, as a, as a, as a, well, so first of all, I didn't realise there, there was literature or resources out there, but going into a library as a 20 year old, mid 20 year old man and saying to the librarian, can you help me please? I'm looking for a book. <laughs> about testicular pain. Yeah, I've lost a ball, I need some help because I'm getting a lot of pain in that area. You're never going to do that. No. Yeah. No. So limited resources. And you know what? In some ways, I think that naivety yeah. and the lack of resources on Do Dr. Google yeah. probably facilitated my recovery. Mm. I changed my lifestyle. I was aware as a therapist at the time, I changed my lifestyle, moved back in with mum and dad, mm -hmm. gave up my job for three months um, exceptionally well. Didn't have to worry about rent or, or eating crap food like I was in the boys' flats I was living in. Stopped my partying habits and lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I, I got better that way. Okay. I think for men at the moment who, and females with pain, mm. uh, pelvic pain, that if you go online, it can be a frightening domain. Oh, it's terrifying. I always tell everyone and patients that are watching this, that when you are at your lowest ebb, where do you go to speak your truth? And the difficulty is that there are very few people that are in our lives that it is appropriate to speak our truth to. Yeah. And when you have Indeed. such an intimate problem, which is often affecting a relationship, um, it's difficult to speak your truth to your partner or your parents who try to make it better or um, other people. So you go online and you tell everyone the intimate details of your life anonymously or with a fake name and you get rid of all your emotions and it makes you feel great but then you put that negative energy into a space that stays there forever. That's so right. there's a couple of websites and I will link to them after this um, and I've forgotten the name of them but there's a couple of patients that have um, have recovered and rehabilitated themselves with a, a mixture of different things and I, I think some of them are physio but it's it's not promoting physio it's promoting recovery mm, um, what a have great a few, yeah Sandy Sandy Hilton talks about them a lot and um, I'll put links to them underneath this we did a course with her last year in October yeah. down in Exeter um, and she mentioned a few links around that because most of the information online once you once you recover and recovery from pelvic pain male or female is perfectly possible yeah. absolutely perfectly possible but once you do recover, you're not going to go back to those support groups, um, forums, and, and it's very unlikely that you're going to divulge information or want to engage in that community again because mm. it can be very, very suffocating. And incredibly draining. Yeah. You know, and if you going back into that level of 
fear, panic, pain, tired fatigue, mm. emotional fatigue mm -hmm. from, from everything it creates can can be very draining so people just don't engage again because they get better and they get on with their lives and and they get on with their lives and they look to the future they want to yeah. progress and there are some people out there who who do want to help and who do have resources and i think we'll start to see a few more of these coming through um but but you're right you want to get back you want to get back on with your life you want mm -hmm. to move further forward and it becomes it, it will always be part of you once you recover from pelvic pain but it's no longer you it's not you it's not your personality anymore it's not your persona in the same way that a breakup from a relationship or you know losing a loved one that's still part of you but it's in Something the past, in the past yeah. yeah it's not what you're currently dealing with no and you can you can choose to not engage with it anymore that's right absolutely yeah. so how has um treatment changed then compared to the, the kind of the, mm. the absolute lack of treatment that you got or any support when you were in your 20s yeah what where do you see where we are now good question so i think um you know, in my early twenty, in my twenties, there was the only um, specialists, practitioners I could have gone to for assistance with would have been neurologists. Mm. There were women's health physios, women's health practitioners, um, twenty uh, twenty odd years ago, fifteen twenty years ago. But the awareness of male pelvic pain wasn't there. Or if it was, it was absolutely mm. minimal. So things have changed. There is still the urological approach and urological treatment, which is good to have. Yeah. But I think. Sorry, apologies, we are in the middle of a hotel in the waiting room. And what's this? It's beautiful, it's really stunning. Um, that, and it's important, so if you are a patient um, who, who does have symptoms of pelvic pain, it's important to get your GP and urologist involved as well. Then need, we need to get the specialists on board to run the tests to ensure that there are no medical red flags. Because, and you know, a lot of the, well, the, the realm that we deal in is very much when pelvic pain persists. Yeah. But there are some simple acute disorders like a twisted testicle or um, infections that are acute, such as transmitted infections that have um, not been picked up. There are things that actually can be treated very quickly and simply with drugs. And then there is a large spectrum of things that really can't. Um, but we need, we need to work as a team. So you need to get your GP and your urologist involved as well. And then, you know, then, then that's when they should be referring onwards to people um, in more therapeutic roles that can help you out. And there are more options available now. So once you've had the test done, and it is to rule out anything sinister. If anything sinister is there, it definitely needs to be addressed and looked at. More often than not, the patient population I see, all their test results come back negative. So that's a good thing. That also means that there's nothing untoward, there's nothing underlying, that the, the patient can be confident and reassured. Well, let me, let, me, let me rephrase this or look at this in a little bit more depth. There should be some reassurance and some acceptance of um, that the test results are clear, and yeah. that's a good thing. But when pain persists beyond that, yes, you've been told all your test results are clear, but I've still got my symptoms. Mm. What the hell is going on here? Where, where, where do I go now? That's where we fit in. Yeah. That's where we tend to pick up patients. Um, and if a patient contacts me and they haven't been to see their GP or urologist, I point them in that direction, have that conversation, have the test, I'll have that dialogue with you, I'll be there to support you through that and make recommendations and suggestions as to what tests should be done. Mm. Um, but once those tests have been done, that's when there's many more options available to you. And because of that, our understanding of, of complex pain, persistent, on, ongoing, long-standing pain, that's pain for longer than three to six months, depending on which articles you read at the moment. Um, when that happens, pain persisting for longer than three months, then it becomes a little bit more complex. Mm. It's not just beautiful. about the tissue. Beautiful. That's I like lovely. complex and beautiful rather than chronic or... Uh, I, I hate the word chronic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big wordsmith. I hate the word chronic. So who was it? There's someone that um, rebranded pain as complex power pain, not chronic power pain. The name escapes me at the moment. Yeah. I've been to see in the last year. I think that's much a much more mm. honest way of talking about it because um, chronicity has a as a negative concept to it. And I know pain is awful, but it's also very clever and it's part of normal homeostasis, so it's how how your body regulates itself. It's just that that regulation has gone awry. It tends bit. to go a little bit out of whack. It's not reflective of normal behaviour, normal things that we would expect to see mm -hmm. pain from. 
And I, I, I've got a blog on my website around the use of words, and I persistent for me is better than chronic. This is my own personal belief. Um, and chronic reminds me of something creaky, like a creaky door shed. It has those connotations. It's as an onomatopoeic word. We're going off track here a little bit, but as an onomatopoeic word, chronic sounds creaky. It sounds like it is stiff and not fluid moving. Yeah, in English parlance, he's chronic. Yeah, it's very, it's very negative. It is, and I think it's also um, uh, old terminology that we're having to use in a modern mm. environment that doesn't quite fit. And the term prostatitis fits exactly like this as well. Blood, but but we're all to do with the prostate, apart from the location. That's really. right. Yeah. So I'm, how how do you? One of the things I really wanted to ask you: How do you explain chronic prostatitis? Good question. It's always interesting to know. Good question. So prostatitis, itis, would suggest inflammation or infection. So we have tonsillitis, laryngitis, appendicitis. We can understand those things as being isolated to that gland or that body part. Mm -hmm. So when, we're di when a patient is diagnosed with prostatitis, you instantly assume, rightly so, that it's to do with the prostate and there is infection or inflammation within the prostate, prostatitis. Mm -hmm. I make quite a bold claim in saying that <clears throat> actually calling pelvic pain Prostatitis is a little bit like calling neck pain tonsillitis. The Ooh. Ooh, I'm going to steal that one. That's a good <laughs> that's one. Yours. I'll give that to yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. It makes me think of something because we, uh, we were at um, World Congress on abdominal pelvic pain last week because mm -hmm. um, we are currently in, where is it, May 2019. And um, Morton, um, you can say a second name. Morton H O E G H. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, his, one of his statements from his speech last week, his conference talk was, um, I'm not sure what anatomy has got to do with pain. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that. And it's a similar thing that, you know, neck pain is not tonsillitis. No, but the same principle is they're yeah. blaming a gland, they're blaming something that might well be contributing, may well, mm. potentially. And it, the, so there are bacterial prostatitis cases. Um, where there is bacteria within the prostate. But more often than not, the percentage of those are, are, are less and less. Yeah. And statistics float around and there's, you know, 90% to 98% or thereabouts are, are, are deemed as being okay. uh, bacterial. Um, and depending on where you do your research and where you do your reading, um, will drive that. And there hasn't yeah. been any research updated recently to suggest actually that population has changed, that percentage has changed. Not at all, not at all. There's, there's really good evidence um, from a bladder perspective that um, I took that question to um, Washington a couple of years ago to World Congress that um, when they talk about irretractable embedded bladder infections and that um, the percentage of people with embedded infections, sometimes it can make a difference. Um, and in, uh, you know, we have a very small percentage of cases that respond very well to antibiotics long term, but we as a species live with embedded infections quite well. So if you think about um, specifically in bladder pain point of view, which is exactly the same as prostatitis or chronic neck tonsillitis. Um, <laughs> very good. I know, it's great, yeah. I'm going to steal that. Um, uh, when, when you put a catheter in someone, you increase the risk of them having an infection. So in our normal population without pain, mm -hmm. that are catheterised, and our elderly that are catheterised, have chronic embedded infections in their bladder, and very little pain or no pain. Um, I know, isn't that good? And when I spoke to some of um, the really specific researchers into... Um, uh, basic science, so we, when we say basic science we don't mean it on a bit basic, we mean the really, really um, cellular level, really yeah, important, yeah. interesting yeah. stuff. Um, and I talked to them about the, the problem of embedded infections, they said, well, yeah, that is a thing, but you know, we all, 20% of the population have MRSA in their groins and their nose embedded, that's why you get swabbed before you have surgery, but we haven't got a chronic nose pain problem within our population. And twenty percent. So, what is it about prostatitis that makes it hurt? Why does it occur? Oh, Julian. <laughs> so there are multiple factors to this, and patients often ask me about the onset of their symptoms. Um, and we we look for something. As human beings, we like to simplify things, so we'll often use something along the lines of a single um, thread theory, single string theory where we attribute the causation, the okay. genesis of something, to one single contributing factor. And we blame, even in flare-ups when we have symptoms, we blame one particular thing. Oh, it was definitely that. I can manage that and deal with that. The reality is it's far more complex. 
And I, um, I use an analogy of a perfect storm with patients, when there's enough elements that come together at the right or wrong time, depending on which way you're looking at this, when a patient ends up in pain. I think, um, and there's no way of testing this, but I believe that when a patient has a range of tests done with their GP or urologist, which is imper imperative, and everything comes back negative, and they're then told by a specialist that it, there's nothing going on here, that it's all in your head, or there's nothing, there's no infection, we can't find anything. Um, you'll just have to live with it. Or, you know what, it will pass by itself or avoid this or avoid that. I think all of those things are really diminutive for diminishing for a patient's life moving further forward. Mm -hmm. Avoid alcohol, avoid caffeine, avoid spicy foods, avoid citrus foods, avoid sex, avoid cycling. That's not, a, that's not a, an enriched life. No. Even if you don't have any symptoms and you're told to start avoiding things, that's not productive. But it also implies causation. So when um, you then start to be in a situation where you are avoiding caffeine and alcohol and sex, apart from ejaculating because you've been told to 15 times a day, um, and uh, riding bikes, sitting down for too long, not leaning over too much in the gym, heavy weights, whatever it is, squats, lifting. squats, lifting, everything, and then your pain comes on, immediately you go, oh, I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So patients then come to you in clinic and say, um, uh, so I had this week, I had a chat that said, I did too much in the pool. And I said, okay, what about what you did was too much? Um, and he says, well, I, I don't know, but it was obviously too much. But he's done the same thing in the pool every week for the last however long we've been working, nine or ten weeks. And what was different about that day is that it was a particularly difficult week at work. Okay. So actually the system was ramped up and then you went into maybe a threatening state. Mm -hmm. But the underlying process in all of this is about how threatened your body is feeling by the potential for um, whatever's going on, the potential what it perceives to have gone. Mm. And none of that means that you're making it up. Not at all, not at all. But, but when we can't find an obvious and, and direct causative factor, then that sometimes the thing that we're told is that you're, it's, not, it's not as bad as you think it is. All the tests yeah. have, have come back clear, so there's nothing wrong with you. And that in itself can be quite a damaging message oh, yeah. to give to a patient as well. There's nothing wrong with you. So there's nothing wrong with you in, in terms of your test results, but it doesn't mean that you're not experiencing your pain. Mm. Your pain is very, very real. Mm. And that is such an important message mm. to, to behold as well, that your pain is very, very real. It's not in your head. There are multiple factors that contribute to this. And not feeling listened to, not feeling heard, can also ramp up our feeling of isolation. And, and when we're talking about pelvic pain, it's not the kind of thing you can go around and talk to your mum about. I've got dick pain. I've got pain on ejaculation. When you go to the shops, a uh, local shop, and you buy your newspaper or your milk, and someone says to you... Okay, brief hiatus. Um, we were talking about how difficult it is to explain that you've got yeah. pain upstairs, <coughs> mm. um, and and often when you when you've not got a cause, when you come back from one of these tests, and there's a um, you know when someone comes home, they're often very devastated. There's like someone that sat in my clinic this week and cried when I finally had to treat them for a long time. Said, what you know where where do you think this is coming from? And they cried and said, well I think I made it. I think I caused this to happen. And that's what often people are left with, or I don't know, it's just happening to me and people won't believe me there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's difficult if you're told all of the tests are negative, how do you understand that actually we can have pain in the body without there being a biological cause? Um, it is a pain, is biological, it's real, it's true, but it can be created within your kind of danger centre as a way of saying, oh, hang on a second, I'm a, I'm a bit under threat because it's considered itself under threat and it continues to perpetuate in that cycle. We are organisms, we're very complex organisms and I know firsthand what phantom ball pain feels like. So there's a lot of research done into phantom limb pain yeah. and, and also phantom limb pain has given us an awful lot of answers in understanding that we look... So historically, we've been told there has to be something wrong with the body parts in order for us to feel pain. Yeah. Tissue change, uh, a burn, a break, a fracture, um, a laceration, etc., in order for us to feel pain. <coughs> you move, you remove, don't, you don't remove someone's arm. Don't remove someone's arm. Please don't do that. Disclaimer for the video. But if someone has, an, uh, if some amputees experience an awful lot of pain. Yeah. 
um, and, and phantom limb pain can be one of the um, reported things that patients feel yeah. from, from amputation. <coughs> now I know, and so that changed an awful lot the way we perceive and we understand how pain works itself. Every now and again, and I don't get pelvic pain, in, in no more than I would get um, an ache in my knee or an ache in my back or an ache in my head, which is just normal, everyday kind of rumblings and grumblings. Which is really normal. Pain is a normal part pain of pain. It's a normal it's thing. It's a normal thing. It's a normal part of pain mm -hmm. But but it can go awry sometimes yeah. and so um, you mentioned earlier on about the guy who was swimming um, and he did the same swim routine but it had a busy week at work I use can I use a second so I use a glass analogy and when there are enough things when the water level rises up enough and we get an overflow of the things in the glass that's when we like to have an increase in pain or a flare up or for pain non pelvic pain patients that might simply be an increase in a health and well-being concern I'm going to give a few examples if I can to expand yeah. on this. A blueberry is a good food. Yeah. A blueberry is a superfood. Maybe. They've been termed a superfood in the past. They have. I'm Lots not sure. I like, yeah. No. What no. happens if you have a two kilograms of blueberries? Oh, your poo goes purple. Yeah, gastric overload. Yeah. So actually, something that's really, really good for us can cause us in the wrong quantity, really, really distressing the situation. Sun. We're, we're told to get sun. We're told to, to expose ourselves to the sun. Too much sun. Turn this colour. Yeah, exactly. Or this colour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are lots of things that are good for us that are too high a dosage can actually become detrimental. Mm. But when we layer these things up and we start to look at a range of other influencing factors around the pain presentation, your guy, your swimming guy, busy week at work, a couple of arguments, maybe not sleeping particularly well, normal swim session. But when we go and we train and we're, we're active, that can put stress on the body itself. Yeah. Glass overflows, he has a, a pain flare up. If I get my, 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 someone doing this to my testicle that's no longer there, that's quite weird, mm -hmm. then it's more often than not because my glass is full. And there are other influencing factors. But at the same time, I might feel generally a bit more fatigued. I might feel a bit more tired. Mm -hmm. I might feel like I need to get more rest. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the pain here. So there are other influencing factors and when you when you were right you said when you when a patient leaves the gp or urologist office and they've been told there's nothing wrong with them they're isolated there, there's often not many people they can turn to and talk genuinely openly and honestly about what's going on and that in itself can also perpetuate a state of anxiety or perceived threats yes which can also then keep the body on high alert we become hyper vigilant to the area if there's nothing wrong with this part of the body then why am i feeling pain I'll make a diary, yeah. I'll journal it, I'll log it, I'll pay attention to every minute change. Mm. We become hypervigilant in the area and we can become a little bit catastrophic sometimes in terms of our thought processes, projecting into the future, how am I going to be able to go to work to, on a date, mm. uh, to sport, how am I going to go on a holiday, you know, all of those things, but we look back retrospectively and think, God, I wish I was back there. Yeah. We're not focusing on ourselves anymore, we project into the future and the past. And all, all of that really ramps up kind of from a, from a mind point of view. Um, at no point does this mean it's in the mind, but it's of the mind, because everything in our body is of the mind. Um, so on a cellular level, we know that if you have more rumination around pain, um, so it's really on your mind, it's on your mind the whole time, um, it's affecting your thinking about, well, I can't do this, and I can't go out for dinner, and I can't mm. go and do my run, or I can't do this. But actually, we do get changes within the body. We ramp up the threat state. The threat state is real, and we know we get cellular ch changes at the level of wherever you're experiencing the pain, be it prostatitis, be it bladder pain syndrome, be it penile pain. Um, we know that you can get increased um, inflammatory markers, we can get increased inflammation, we can get changes in the blood flow, um, the pelvic floor goes into some degree of spasm mm -hmm. with lovely areas of tension myalgia yeah. um, and we get um, <laughs> um, so uh, you know there are physiological changes that go along with this and they are of and because, because of um, uh, more kind of social or psychological factors but they're real and true mm. and so you know I'm I, uh, I'm sure there's a video out there called My Why. Um, so I, because of my open heart surgery, I'm exactly the same as you. That if I get tired, I get a very achy chest, mm -hmm. yeah. and everything gets very tight, and I can feel it's a very strange feeling. Although um, testicular 
Phantom Pain is pretty weird oh, and cool, I'm sure. Yeah. Not horrible, but nonetheless. It's, I, odd. it's made me question and made me realise an awful lot more around what pain actually is. Yeah. Because experiencing something firsthand, a sensitivity that isn't related to a body part or you're not, it's not like someone is, you haven't done a heavy swim session to get yeah. chest pain. No, no. It's just there's an increased level of what could be called central yeah. sensitization. Oh, definitely. Central sense, so a, a, a brainy pain state based on, in my case, most of the time, lack of sleep. Mm. But I'm, I become aware, sensate of the whole of the inside of my chest line. I can tell you I become hyper sensitive. And that isn't because I'm making it, it's because the lack of sleep ramps up the perceived threat because you're a dampened, your system is dampened, so your brain is always trying to keep you aware, alive, aware of the bears. So you become a bit more hyper vigilant, hyper aware of um, the threat, and that means that you ramp up your nerves. Now the nerves in my chest will tend to be quite high heightened anyway, most of the time because of post surgery. surgery. Post surgery, there was a there was a reason for them to be, and there isn't, and it hasn't been for 10, 12 years. But nonetheless, when I become dampened or threatened in general, or if I'm stressed, then I become very hyper vigilant and aware of it. But what makes it better? Chilling out, stretching relaxing, sleeping, eating well, all the things that we know that, that make things better. And it's not because, yeah, balancing, parasympathetic activity, which I go about a lot, I've gone a lot uh, about in these kind of videos with, the, um, with physios. Because there are loads of things that you can do, and it isn't, um, if, you're a, if you're a pelvic pain sufferer listening to this, I don't mean to go away with the, thinking, the thought that we're just going to make you like sleep and eat well. Um, <laughs> it may be part of it. It may be part of it. Um, but it, we, you need to look more intrinsically at the drivers that you have and then holistically at the system. So in male pelvic pain, and we're going to be interested to see how you approach it, um, obviously we look at the physical drivers, we, we look at the physical and emotional and social drivers all in one set, two sessions generally I do. Um, I have a big long chat with someone about stuff before I go anywhere near touching them. Yeah. Um, just to see what, what has been going on, how they're feeling about that and what else might be impacting on it. Because we're really looking out for you know, what kind of tension we've got, but also what's going on in life. And then from the point of view of, um, we may have to pause in a minute, um, that, uh, I'm not trying to So tension is an interesting thing, isn't okay. it? So we, we often talk of you know, the other things, the upregulation of hypervigilance and central sensitization. Um, you mentioned cellular changes, inflammation, um, nerve sensitivity. But if you, if these things get wrapped up and we feel more sensitive, we have these clenching and protective behaviours anywhere in the body. So I, I give the example: if someone has neck stiffness or neck pain, they're just not going to move that part of the body. They're going to be more protective of it. Maybe their shoulders might come up. Maybe their jaw might clench. They might get headaches or neck pain or chest pain or back pain. Um, <laughs> back in the room. Back in the room. Um, micro macro changes that you get. Yeah, so you were discussing things like um, localised inflammation or sometimes systemic inflammation, um, increased nerve sensitivity. You may see changes to blood flow, hemodynamics. We get micro changes, but then we can also get macro changes as a result of that. So we might then see clenching or protective behaviours occurring anywhere in the body. Pelvic floor is very, very reactive to stressors or distress. We know that um, one of my favourite studies, I'm sure you know this one as well, that when they showed patients, they showed people, not patients, um, scary videos, scary films, and they looked at different muscles in the body, um, and the first one to respond and clench was the pelvic floor. So when you are threatened, your tail goes between your legs, because that's what that muscle does in dogs. Um, but in humans, we clench. We the same thing. Okay. But this, so the interesting thing about that is we, we, can, we intellectually understand a film is not going to harm us. We can yeah. rationalise that on an intellectual level, but from a physiological point of view, we, we, there is no difference. It's perceived threat. You know, the reason horror films do so well, an awful lot of the reason horror films is because they work on the psychology of, of human beings. Yeah. They get that, that threat response, they get that stress response. That's why they're so, not for me personally, but why an awful lot of people like them. So micro changes, um, we can even go down to things like the Krebs cycle we were just talking about yeah. now as well. So Krebs cycle, energy production, energy reproduction, recycling of energy. Those micro changes, if we're in a sensitized state and we're not able to recover effectively, 
then actually our energy production starts to change as well, which then has a knock-on effect onto our fatigue levels. Um, when we get fatigued, we're more likely to be susceptible to things like colds or flus or, or, or just other sensitivities. Our immune system gets out of whack. We're, as you can now see, we're complex. Most of the time, muscles get a really bad reputation for the cause of pelvic pain. They're contributing factors, but let's look beyond muscles. Let's take into consideration the nervous system. Yeah, and I, d I don't. I, I would. I would almost disagree. But I know that you, that's not what you mean. That muscles aren't. They they contribute, but they don't contribute because they're they're a victim as well. We know that we have centralized processes that I go into in depth and I've done in previous videos about why you get attention on your pelvic floor. That was going to be my PhD. And it was answered a couple of years ago. Um, so we know your brain. Um, creates this tension state, possibly in a response to other kind of sensory and motor areas in the brain heightening. But we also get this kind of visceral emotional response. But so as, as, as therapists or people treating this area, we spend a lot of time kind of lengthening the pelvic floor. But as Laura said, and I'm pretty sure I stole this from a couple of years ago, you cannot lengthen a muscle without growing sarcomeres. And you can't do that in 30 seconds, but you can improve the resting tone of the muscle by desensitizing it. And that's um, often the state is because we get those changes in blood flow within the muscle, which when they're tightened, we don't, you, you can't get good blood flow through the muscles. So you get venous cooling, so you get areas of kind of edema, swelling. Or um, ischemia as well, yeah, which causes sensitivity. Well. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to get aching, throbbing, all these kind of generalized pain type, um, states within the muscle just because the muscle's in a bad way. If you imagine going into, it's exactly the same, kind of, as cramping a cuff. Great analogy, great. Um, what we do with a cuff, I'm sure we, we heard Sandy say this last year, mm -hmm. is the last thing you do with a cuff is go, oh, don't touch it. You know, you <laughs> leave it alone, leave yeah, it alone. Yeah, leave it alone, leave it alone. You stamp on it and you get it to lengthen. So that's mm -hmm. what, from a therapy point of view, it's where we see huge gains quite quickly, often, is where we're able to engage in muscle, neuromuscular relaxation. Um, what I am trying to define as my fascial release and release or relaxation of the muscles in the fascial system. I think it's the only term that we've got that really describes the process that we go through. Um, and it's important we all talk about the same thing because then we can search it when we do our research papers. And I don't have a better term that's all encompassing. Anyway. At the moment. At the moment. There may be more. Um, as things come through, we change it. But also, yeah, the desensitization, you get those heightened processes within the nerves. And the nerves in your muscles become really super sensitized. They're going to fire more often, and we're going to sensitize the nose receptors. And then the information over a period of three to six months that goes into your brain becomes um, much more important to the brain from that area, yeah. and much more always reported, uh, responsible for a threat. So it may be that your guts are moving around, it may be that you got up quickly and your urine stretched your bladder wall mm -hmm. and you might have had a slight micro contraction because the bladder wall suddenly stretched and it went oh I don't want to stretch myself too far so it micro contracts and then your brain hears all of that information and goes whoa threat bubbles yeah. and then you get testicular pain or penile pain or normal sensations become very blurred so mm. patients often don't know when the bowel is full or when the bladder is full so you might have an increased urgency earlier on because those normal signals of, of the bladder filling become exaggerated or ex exacerbated and the system not necessarily the person but the system perceives that as being well there's new input there's new sensation happening here yeah we don't know what it is we'll treat it as a threat level and therefore we can get even more vigilant around things like bladder voiding yeah. You know, and you, you do an awful lot of bladder work. So yeah. our urgency increases, the number of times we feel we need to go into the bladder increases as well. Normal sensations get uh, get get um, amplified and increase, so they no longer are behave they no longer behave as normal signals from the area. No. And that can be very confusing for patients. And it's it's from a from a therapist's point of view, it is a really lovely way of um, knowing. Just gonna see if we can pause there one minute. And back in the room. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, we were talking about um, uh, uh, oh, therapist point of view. Um, so from a therapist point of view, one of the one of the ways it's really easy to eke out that we may not have um, correct, true, or more what Lauren calls precise proprioception going on mm -hmm. is whether we do have these interactions between different things. So really simple questions when you're going through your um, how's my bladder moving? How's my brow? How's your bowels? You know, how often do you open your bowels? Does it affect your symptoms? 
how often do you go to the toilet for your bladder? And you can we can make judgment calls on whether people um, have effective um, movements of those kind of organs. Um, frequency and duration, all that kind of stuff are deferment, but whether or not it's affecting their symptoms is really important. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it may not be, I've had guys before that, and actually I have um, lots of people, actually I had one last week that came in and he's had some post um mm -hmm. syndrome mm -hmm. pain, which is an interesting one, and um, came in and said, yeah, I need a bit of a once over, I, I'm, I need a bit, of, it's been really sore, I haven't been able to do anything. And we talked to him, we talked to him, and ah, actually, yeah, I've been really constipated this week. Okay. And it's that that's been kicking things off, and he, his brain cannot discern between constipation and threat and mm -hmm. other things going on, so he's getting a little bit, and the, the reason for constipation is complex, but yeah. We're also dealing with a highly nerve-innovated part of the body as well, aren't we? Yeah. You know, so already it's a sensitive bowl, it's a sensitive... <laughs> Uh, geographical location within the system so as soon as things get a little bit heightened a little bit sensitive and it's, it's so it's sensitive for a very good reason it needs to be sensitive for us to be able to enjoy things like sexual function for us to be able to empty our bowel successfully in an ideal world or empty our bladder successfully so we get that we've, feedback we've got to be kind of encouraged to do those things yeah for the fulfillment of the species mm -hmm, that's right yeah Although, i mean we wouldn't be here doing this podcast either no exactly <laughs> exactly it's feeling great yeah um but it it, it it is important that we have good sensation in those areas, and that's why they're heightened, but they're also incredibly emotional. Mm. So we have, you know, we have pelvic pain specifically, and actually to some degree, well, pelvic pain, I would say, out of the whole of the body, is probably one of the areas most um, sensitive and uh, where it's the most easy to have that perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. all of those things about fatigue and diet and stress and lifestyle and all those kind of things will affect everywhere. Um, but they affect the areas that are the most emotionally sensitive to us and physically sensitive to us, um, the greatest, and the ones we can't see. Well, also, like backs as well. Yeah, exactly. Well, with backs as well, you can say to someone, okay, you're sensitive, why don't we reduce what you're lifting or, or avoid, I don't never say avoid lifting for yeah. now, but, but perhaps let's consider how to change that. Yeah. You can't say to someone, right, well, don't pee for a couple of days and we'll see how that works out for you. Or don't have a bowel movement for a week and then we'll kind of revisit things. This is normal function that we cannot stop yeah. because actually if we do stop them, then that has much, much greater knock-on effects to our health and well-being as an organism as well. So going back to my question originally when you were talking about explaining to patients, I think it's a, it's a silly question because I think I know the answer to it, but how, um, how do you approach starting treatment mm -hmm. with people? Good question. And so... Um, there are a number of reasons I do these, but I have a huge amount of contact with my patients from the initial um, email inquiry or telephone inquiry they send through. I, I send a, a, a long, so the number of forms I get my patients to complete before I see them is a medical intake form. We then look at GAD7 forms, PCS forms. So this is general anxiety disorder, pain catastrophization, pain self-efficacy. I include in there the National Institute of Health, uh, CPSI. CPSI, the Chronic yeah. Prostatitis Score Index. So it gives me a range of data um, to track and, and uh, uh, um, see a patient's progress, but also it's relevant to the individual. Um, from there I arrange an initial Skype consultation, which takes about 30 minutes. This is to go through in fine detail the, the intake forms, to build up an even bigger rapport with the patient. We, at that point I start to get them to between the end of the Skype and the face-to-face -face session, I get them to start thinking about goals. So I ask them, I'd like you to identify three things you'd like to be doing more of and three things you'd like to be doing less of. And it gets them thinking when they've recovered. And then we start working towards them in the face-to-face -face session. So already they're looking beyond where they are and they're looking at things that really influence their own individual, because it is individual. Although there might be some similar symptoms from patient to patient, the individual goes through the, their... Um, their case by themselves quite often uh, because it can be so isolated. So these meaningful activities to do more of or less of then set the precedent for where I take the face-to-face -face session. So before I even see a patient, we've spent a lot of time with them going through understanding, creating that therapeutic alliance, building up trust. And normally a patient may have had 5, 10, 15 minutes with a GP or urologist up to that point or they've gone in and been dismissed off pretty quickly. The face to face session, the initial one is 100 minutes, and that's where I do wow. up to 100 minutes. Sometimes it goes beyond that, but we sit down, 
I go through the, um, the case again and I say, okay, where do you want to take this? What are your objectives? What, are you, what's you, what do you want from the session? I have my bias, I have my agenda, but this is your time, so let's use it wisely. And I always, start, I always include, through metaphor, through storytelling, things like the water glass analogy or the bear. You mentioned the bear. So the, 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 we, can, we, can, we can poke the bear, thank you Greg, this is yours, we can poke the bear, Greg Lehman, but we can't hunt the shit out of it. It's okay <laughs> to push and to, to adapt the system, but don't piss it off. Yeah. It's these yeah. principles and practices that allow a patient, through fun metaphor and storytelling, we deliver really serious um, science and medical information in a nice packaged format. Yeah. Then do a range of assessments, physical um, movement, and then start setting up a self-care programme for a patient that's individualised to them, which will include their meaningful activities as well. This is one of the things that often um, I get emails back, and I'm sure you get emails as well from people saying, I've got this patient, tell me how to treat them. Mm. And you just kind of, it's, it's one of the things that I do in my teaching, give out some guidance. So there is a, a good amount of research that says six weeks of myofascial release, any kind of pelvic floor active work, um, should reduce symptoms and my data reflects the international kind of the big six seven trials we've got now um, of about 50 percent reduction in in symptoms mm -hmm. um, of bladder urgency and pain when you're touching the pelvic floor which i think is really interesting and cool that you can touch the pelvic floor go nowhere near the bladder do no bladder interventions mm -hmm. and change visceral pain mm -hmm. um in six weeks and i don't say that to say right you have to do six weeks of this treatment it's a this is a guide for the kind of improvement that you should see but also about increasing your um kind of giving people a little bit more um, power to their elbow so that you don't feel that when you're seeing patients for five weeks and you're kind of like oh where are we getting to you, you know that you know you are continuously doing it because the point of view is repetition mm -hmm. you're teaching the system i am safe um, yeah, because really you've done all of that stuff you've built that therapeutic alliance um, you've given them a desensitised approach just because you are trying to help them, you're listening to them, you're really, you're in there with them, it's a collaboration, mm -hmm. and then you're doing something with them to them, but with their full understanding, so that's desensitising and just ramping it down. Um, uh, I've, got, I've just got Greg's comments in my head, now you know what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, that's where we're going to go. Um, so uh, you, you, you're just bringing it down and actually that ramping down of the system we know needs to happen for about six weeks so it, you know I did work into the wand and um, there's lots of work in using manual devices we know it doesn't have to be a therapist it can be the patient themselves very happily there isn't actually data to show how effective it is versus therapy and I'd suggest a, a little bit I did a little bit of it but there's, there's not very much at all but it, it's I'd suggest the therapeutic alliance and seeing someone is partly um, and having someone give you information back to you is part of the empowerment i don't think that the therapist lengthening the muscle um you know finding the trigger points and getting rid of them just sticking them until they're gone is actually what creates the difference it's about it's about really ramping down the ner nervous system and creating safety mm. and a safe space and then giving them that experience of safety and then giving them the ability to create that safety in themselves Totally, and I, this is the reason why I spend so much time in giving patients an understanding as the contributing factors, because mm. they then feel a bit more safe. Yeah. They then create trust in themselves again. They then start to believe that actually, although the test results have come back clear, maybe there isn't anything really sinister going on. Maybe it is around sensitivity, yeah. if we really, really break it down. That there's not a tear or um, a break or anything along those lines. That it is more about tissue sensitivity in a very sensitised part of the body. Yeah. Self-efficacy for me, teaching patients their own self-care is huge because they then start to... It's, it's the best thing you can do. All of the evidence shows um, the minute that we take um, the impetus off us to heal yeah. as healers and we say, how, how, are you, how are you doing with that? Or... How are you thinking of moving forward? And we give people the power to change their own lives. That's mm. when things improve. Yeah. Much, you know, all across the board, from carpal tunnel syndrome to, to, to chronic tonsillitis to uh, <laughs> whatever else that we have. Yeah. If you've got self-efficacy, you're going to move people forward faster. Totally. And when a patient only feels they make progress in your clinical office for one hour per week, mm. that's an awful lot of pressure to place. So it takes away 
it's disempowering for the patient and places emphasis on the on the therapist as the key element to get them out of their pain presentation. That's not for me empowering for the individual. I like to make the pa the patient the driver in their recovery, not just the passenger. I want them to be at the driving seat. I want them to steer the car. I'll guide them. I'm almost like a sat nav is what I uh, what I tell my patients. Yeah. I'll we'll point you in the right direction. Every now and again, we may need to do a U-turn and come back to things. Yeah. That's recovery. And that, that means we're then offering bespoke and individualised care for that particular individual based on their case and their set of symptoms and their history and their lifestyle and everything else that comes along with that individual. So next time either of us get that email, this is, I'm just going to send a link to this, <laughs> yeah. Watch to this, this video. Watch this video. Watch this video. Because it, it is, we are, we are the holders of um, a great deal of knowledge of what can be available mm -hmm. from... PTNS, a posterior tibial nerve stimulation, be it acupuncture based, be it electro stim, be it tens machines, which I like. I use tens a lot because they're they're not um, offensive mm -hmm. and they tingle away nicely. Um, yeah. And there's something you can simply put on and, and have around the house as a different stimulus to um, bional boots. So mm -hmm. using different sounds and, yeah. and and trying to repeat motions mm -hmm. to lots of different stuff, a graded motor imagery, thinking we we have. So many tools available to us. Isn't yeah, there? So, so so many different things that you mm. can do. Um, that and I will say to patients often, um, and they say, oh, "I've been through physio." I get a lot of abuse on YouTube. I've, I'm afraid I've stopped um, uh, interacting, so you won't find me in the comments. Just because I get a lot of abuse of people that have been to see someone that have been acupunctured and they get better, and so they come back for their acupuncture and they get better, but they haven't actually been led towards developing their own strategies and moving forward and acupuncture is fine it, you know mm -hmm. in, I, from my point of view I think it it opens up your parasympathetic activity we get a massive parasympathetic response yeah. you get a bit of descending inhibition it makes you feel better it's an in it's a way into opening up the system to have that experience but it shouldn't be relied upon to um, and I'm telling myself this because we've all got those patients that are relying on acupuncture and we need to move them forward on to, to more kind of South efficacious roots of, mm. of how passive therapy is absolutely fine. I have no issues with passive therapies. If someone doesn't like needles, suggesting to them they should go and get acupuncture to, as as to to help to calm down the sympathetic nervous system is probably not the right thing to do. No. So maybe but a massage would do the same. Maybe massage, maybe reflexology. It's just I'm lazy. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't want to massage every day. Hard work. While talking to them, but, but they, you know, even massages are amazing opportunities. Mm. If someone's really ramped up, get them lying on their face if they're feeling safe, mm -hmm. and gently touch their back or their pelvis or their arms or whatever and you will see them have that parasympathetic response to cheese we call it yeah. in acupuncture and you'll see them calm down and they'll feel great when they sit up and you'll have talked to them about all of the things that you wanted to yeah, talk captive about captive audience then, yeah. don't you? You, have yeah. the, you have the ability then to impart that knowledge around a bit of pain science mm. that's wrapped up in a very palatable um, digestible fashion as well I'm giving you a trick to the trade now so if anyone comes in and I end up um, but yeah, the the old, face down, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just because I want them to listen. Oh, no, maybe but, not. But I think also that this is important. I think as therapists, we have a, um, a duty of care to our patients to be able to give them that information as well. Yeah. You know, because our words can be incredibly detrimental. Detrimental. We, no, see by language. We talked about it today yeah. um, as well. That. The, the amount of negative language, so I get at least eight emails a week, it's more than one a day, saying, um, my therapist has found trigger points in my pelvic floor, please can you tell me how to use the wand to get rid of them? Mm -hmm. And if you give someone something, it's a monkey, they carry their monkey. I like that. Amanda Savage. Ah, Amanda Balaghi. She <laughs> spent her life telling me to give back the monkey because I've taken on something else to do. Mm. But, you know, mm. and all the, everyone now, if you have a feeling of your shoulders, I've been sat down all day, oh, there's mm. a nice big area there that's sore, there's a big area. Oh, that's a really nice sore. But there must be, if there's pain there on palpation, there must be something wrong with your shoulder. There is, is that not, nothing wrong with really? my shoulder. Can I, yeah, give me your hand a second? I know. What about this bit in here? Oh, which is, yeah bit further back and it'll be really painful. Oh. Further across. So there must yeah. be something wrong with that hand. There's nothing wrong with this hand. Are you sure? But it's painful. This hand is fine. The muscles are a little bit tight and sore and that's because I haven't moved today. Yeah, we've been sat uh, at Laura Mimosley's um, conference on pain, not yeah. explain pain, not noise. It's Laura Mimosley's gig. So yeah. there's been a lot of 
um, assimilation of, of information or just sitting down and trying to take on board what's happened. So I'm stiff, I'm achy, yeah. um, I and need to get normal. up and move. Yeah, perfectly. We, we, our systems have been at rest. Yeah. And that, and that kind of... So the minute that we, we tell people, you have muscle tension, therefore that is causing your pain, um, that's a really poor concept. It, also, it reduces their pain to just being a physical entity. Mm -hmm as opposed to, now that's aching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there must be something wrong with your hand. There must be something wrong with your hand. Um, as opposed to, um, for whatever we, for what, what, so classically, right, when, when I did research, when I do a lot of writing um, for journals and stuff, I would be sitting like this for a long period of time. So you get tight, you get fixed into yeah. that position, and so you might get achy. And the achy is not necessarily because my muscles are tight and they're causing the aching. The muscles are tighter because I haven't moved and I've been in a fixed posture for a long period of time. So they've had to sustain a contraction to keep me in that posture. And that sustained contraction for a long period of time, it's a bit like post-postural contraction. If you put your arms out, if you stand in a doorway and go like this really hard for a while and then step forward, your arms float up mm -hmm. because your muscles continue to contract. Um, so if you're in a sustained contracted position, I don't mean contracted, just even in this position, I'm, yeah. I'm being held. For any length of time. For any length of time, your muscles are going to keep doing that. They're working hard, so you need to get up and move. We're built to move. But also your body, by, gi by, 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 by giving you the experience of aching muscles, it's communicating with you saying, move. we need to move. Yeah. I go through a range of different things like this with my patients. So if we, if we if we've had too much sun, we get sensitive to the sun, we get sunburn. If we've had too much... So if we, if we inhale something that's not good for our systems or it's sensitising, we sneeze. It's our body's way of reminding us that actually that's probably not a good thing, maybe move away from it. If we vomit something back up, that's our body's way of telling us, probably don't have that again. Yeah. Our bodies talk to us all the time, but quite often we don't listen to them or we don't understand, and I'm not saying I'm an expert at this by any stretch of the imagination, we don't understand and we see pain as being a bad thing. Mm. Pain, pain is, is necessary. No. Pain is really useful. You'd not want to live without pain. So that lady that recently has been diagnosed as not having no susception or not having the ability to have pain or create pain in her body. Um, it's a really dangerous life. There's a population she, up in Sweden, I think, yeah. that are being investigated. They and patients who who don't experience pain ever, mm -hmm. ever, 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 ever. Um, uh, they often don't live past thirty years old. Yeah, they cut things off. They get gangrenous. They get infections. Mm. Um, it's a really bad thing. Pain is, is very useful. can be incredibly informative, providing we, we're able to understand it and work with but someone when, who can teach us how to. Yeah, but when we're in a position where actually our nociception, our, our pain, has become the primary thing that our system is concerned with because we are not homeostatically regulating the rest of us, for whatever reason, we're completely out of kilter, um, uh, we're, and we're fighting bears all the time, then we need to get out of that system mm. and sometimes it takes a bit of time and a bit of thought and a bit of input but the more different inputs that you can put into that constant chronic cycle the more that you can come out of it and you know we're both um, I don't talk about myself very often but I had you know eight years of chronic pain in lots of different places and I'm now pain free I know I same same I, yeah. I had a horrific experience of my pelvic pain um, and I now don't get I don't get the flare ups I don't have that ongoing um, gnawing deep aching pain around my testicle or my perineum or my, around urination. That's just it's a thing of the it's past. Normal. Yeah, it's a thing of the past. And it's it, that can be normal. And I think um, yes, it's probably easier for us to sit here and say that because we're both health professionals, so we're highly educated in this area. But and that probably has that has changed our neuro tags of thoughts yeah. and beliefs that will affect how long-lasting that cycle of perpetual pain was but i'm sure it, you know when we were in it it wasn't easy to dig yourself out of it god no no you kind of almost feel like you're in quicksand or sinking yeah. sand it's very difficult to get hold of a grasp of anything and when you do get hold of a grasp of something you don't want to let go of that you want to hold on to that for dear life and then the next week it's bad again yeah and you're like what the how is this happening yeah but i think i um from a physio point of view very quickly um you can become I became very comfortable with it. Okay, well, this week I'm in pain. Next week I'll be better. Yeah. And let me design my life around what keeps me better. So I did loads of, I did seven hours of Pilates teaching a week and lots of hydrotherapy and I run and I do triathlons. But um, now managing my pain is much more about managing um, energy and managing emotions. So mm -hmm. am I doing enough mindfulness? Am I seeing my family? That kind of, yeah, balancing yourself. Balancing the scales. So 
What um what three things yep. would you say to professionals? Mm -hmm. What pieces of wisdom would you share with professionals um, managing or trying to get into treating or managing male pelvic pain? I would encourage um, practitioners who, who do see um, male pelvic pain patients to consider the elements of the bio biology, the psychology and the sociology. We talked today about how they shouldn't be separated, no. how there should be one entity together, the biology, the psychology, the sociology. But when we, when we look at the biology, and this might be sensitivity, it might be holding patterns, it might be the way a person moves, or, 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 or clenching behaviour, that can give us a clue. But don't stop there. Look beyond that. Look at how that then has a knock-on effect onto their psychology, their thought processes, their beliefs, their faith systems. Um, how that in influences their confidence and their, F their own self-efficacy. And then look at interactions, relationships, socialising. How that has a knock-on effect onto work. How they stop, you know, they stop going to their club to go and play tennis. And that, that removes a whole element of who they are. So actually the three things I'd suggest that people look at, the biology, biology psychology and sociology. Perfect. Listen the, to a patient. The, yeah, the, who is it that says listen to your patients and they will teach you how to treat how to, them? Yeah, they have all the clues and the answers themselves. They have all the answers. Um, from a so social point of view, we, we can't... Um, what's it called? There's a, word, there's a word I'm looking for. Diminish. There you go. We can't diminish pain. Um, to be just their social circumstances. And we all know there are certain um, uh, sections of patients who are, you can, you can see very easily from the outset that actually their socioeconomic situation, their difficulty at home, social drivers for their pain are great. It doesn't mean you dismiss them. No. The amount of patients that I've seen that who their isolation um, is a massive factor in their pain. Mm -hmm. When I used to work in slightly, in the NHS and slightly kind of poorer areas, that wouldn't get out to the pub, wouldn't, you know, the loss of, I live and uh, work in South Wales and the, um, the mining communities, when the pub started closing and the mining communities are up big hills and you've got some pain, then it's difficult if you've got to go further to the pub and then if you stop seeing your friends so often and then it just spirals and actually pain increases and it is a legitimate cause of pain. It doesn't mean, yeah. oh, there, it's in their head. No, we know that those neuro tags work together and we end up hypersensitizing the system a social interaction it ramps down some of those threat states and the yeah. inflammatory drivers and the sensitivities so yeah they are they are equally as powerful and yeah we need to be looking at those okay so what three things would you say to um, men with pelvic pain mm -hmm. so the very first thing has to be if you haven't done this already go and get yourself tested Go to the GP, go to the urologist, go to the gun clinic, rule things out. Make sure there are no medical red flags that may be influencing your pain state. That has to be the foundation before anyone else can move further forward with recovery. Yeah. Secondly, know that there is help out there. You're not alone. There are, there are resources now. There are physios and therapists across the UK and across the world indeed that are now offering um, resources, treatments, support guidance for patients like yourself or people that you know that have symptoms of pelvic pain so you're not alone and work in collaboration with your therapist mm -hmm. this has to be essential as well you as an individual you the patient you know your body far best than any expert can ever claim to know your body mm. you hold the answers to how to get you out of your pain state but unless you have a strong collaboration a strong therapeutic alliance with a compassionate um, a therapist will spend the time to go through things and to, to help you get out of that, that your, your current situation, then you're missing a whole part of recovery, the whole potential of recovery as well. That's brilliant. I absolutely agree. Good, that makes my life a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think most people would. Yeah. Um, that, that collaboration is, is really important. Mm. I think um, a, lot of, a lot of people feel really disempowered when they go to see a health professional yeah. um, because they say, oh, he says I've got this, so I need that. And I get a lot of patients that, um, if uh, so, say we use cystoscopy as mm -hmm. an example. So yep. when people put a, a camera into the blood, and um, a lot of patients will come to me and say, right, I'm, uh, they want me to have a cystoscopy. If it's the first time round, that's standard. That's a normal part of nice guidance. Um, yep. All patients, like um, Carl was saying, need to have a cystoscopy before before they end up with me from a bladder pain point of view as part of the investigations. But if it's kind of their third or fourth one. And you're kind of, we get to a point where we go, well, why are they doing it? 
most of the time, to be honest, my consultants, I'm able to have that chat with them yeah. um, and say, well, what's your reason? And if you're suspecting something or you're suspecting you'll get some useful information, great. But things like that will actually be quite detrimental because it might flare symptoms up. It's going to put you back in a horrendous position yeah. for a couple of days. <clears throat> and actually the, the patient patients need to be a bit more empowered to kind of go why am I having it what benefit is there going to be to me having this treatment what are the negatives and really having a, an open conversation like you were saying with your well we were saying you should have had your doctor who should have said um let you know I can see that you're worried or you're nervous about your fertility let's have a conversation about that mm. instead of saying don't worry about it I can see that this is what you're going through yeah it's acknowledging the patient and their current situation and then, then it's a case of, right, I've, I've, I've become aware of this, I'm making you aware that I'm aware of this, mm. now what do we do about this? Yeah. You start to create an, an alliance, and elite, you know, a, um, a working relationship towards recovery. Yeah, yeah. So, so powerful. Working together. Yeah. Dream team. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good phrase, and I, I, again, who have we stolen that off? You'll find, the more videos that we do with more people, I'm finding that um, uh, you are a product of the, of the learning that you do. Mm, the people so, that you're around. Yeah, yeah, so the, the more, the wider the breadth of learning that you can have, the better. Mm -hmm. um, but that thing about the patient is the expert in themselves. I always say to people, you are the best expert in you, let yep. no one tell you otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, because you're in your body and I'm not. And you have to deal with it every single day. You know yeah. the nuances, you know what it's like to get up in the morning, or to brush your teeth, or to go and empty the bladder, or to, to have sex, or to go to, to, to try and go and have a social life with someone. You know, whether that's with your partner or friends or family, you know what that feels like wholeheartedly. Yeah, so, and we want to, and we don't, so you need to tell us. Mm. And that's the last thing I would add, um, is don't be embarrassed. Um, I, you can see there are male therapists that you can come and work with. Um, and actually, uh, Carl's on one of my standard um, emails that I bounce back to my patients. Um, I always give men an option because I, you know, looking at downstairs is like looking at elbows to me. I've seen so many. Yeah. Um, it's it, we're, we're medical professionals, so it's 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 boring, um, and we will ask you lots of in-depth questions. But you're probably the fourth or fifth person at least that morning mm -hmm. that we've asked these questions about, and we're asking them for very specific reasons. We take due care and attention, and we know that they're very difficult for you to answer. But from our point of view, we're really we're interested in the answers, but we're not taking any kind of, you know. It's data, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 information. it's information for us. So when yeah. I'm asking about someone's sex life, I generally, if there's a pause, I say, look, I'm really not interested in your sex life, but I'm interested in how your pudendal nerves and the anterior clitoral mm. nerves are working. Yeah. And they go, oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> and you might want to try and find, you know, with sex, it might be simply a case of, right, I'm not interested in your sex life, but if we can find a position that's more comfortable for you, then that's a working model moving further forward, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm only interested in your sex life as far as goes if you want to be having it and you're not. Yeah. Then we're going to try and help mm -hmm. you to have that together, but we're, we're obviously not going to be involved. No, we won't be there coaching you. Yeah, <laughs> on the the yeah. Do I really want to run aside? Is that better? <laughs> that's horrendous. I can't yeah. look at that too much. But um, yeah, just don't be embarrassed. No. Um, so when, when patients, uh, a lot of, I don't think a lot of men go and seek help. Um, and certainly we're not out there we are out and proud about services that we provide but um, when they do seek help it's, it takes a lot of effort and, and courage massive amounts of courage mm -hmm. you know you have to be incredibly brave to even turn up and we know that everything when you go to a clinic and certainly our clinics running the same way we will send you questionnaires before you get to us um, when you get to our spaces um, pelvic health clinics tend to be run incredibly privately yeah. so um, I have a space which has other people in the clinic and office around me, but it's very private. There tends to be one patient in the waiting room at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it's really comfortable. You can have a cup of tea. Yeah. Um, the rooms are completely closed, private. You won't get anyone else in there. So you can speak your truths quietly. But also know that there are male, there are lots of women's health physios, mm -hmm. so females that will treat um, male problems. And if you're okay with that, great. And I get all the men that I see are great with that. Yeah. And if you don't want to see a woman, that's also fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so in my standard form now I have uh, two, I have a, a local guy um, who treats male pelvic pain and I also, I see a lot of patients that come over from London or do other stuff and I will send them to Carl because you have options. And there, and that's also empowering to know as well that you're not going through this by yourself, there are other people out there. Um, and it's important to talk. It, Bob Hoskins said a while back, a couple of decades ago now, but it is, it's really, it's good to talk. 
I think the more we're able to talk about this, the more honest and open we are about our pelvic pain, men and female. I'm going to um, send this particularly to, uh, to you chaps as well, but it's really, really common, like more common than we're let on to believe. And the, the, inc the prevalence and incidence reports that we have in studies, I don't think tells the whole picture. No. We, we, people don't report it. No. You know, we, we know we're vastly out on female issues and female pain, and that um, is a little bit more socially appropriate. Mm. Um, I, I would, yeah. It, I think men will silently put up with pain. It's and normally two years, I think it is, before a man will go to the doctor and report there's some, not necessarily pelvic pain related, but report a health concern or a health issue. Mm. Maybe in that time he has or he hasn't spoken with friends or family. Um, that's an awful long time to be suffering in silence, an awful long time yeah. to be suffering in silence. So, so let's get talking, let's be open and honest with ourselves, um, let's engage as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, I was going to say, species? Uh, as a, yeah, as a species, as a gender as well, let's engage. Yeah. Let's not go down the pub and just joke about our dicks, let's actually start talking about them proactively. That's a really important message. Yeah, as an important part of your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I know that you've got um, a support group, mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that? Yes, thank you very much. So I, uh, I run uh, an online support group for men suffering with pelvic pain. Um, we have anything from um, little um, chat rooms within the support group itself. They're offered via Zoom. I will have guest speakers. We had Henri Astier, who's a BBC journalist who wrote an article about how he recovered from pelvic pain. He gave a presentation. I've got um, a uh, clinical psychologist who's just going through and doing her PhD. Um, Sally, hi Sally if you're listening to this or watching it, um, she's just about to do some research into men with pelvic pain and, and she will be uh, part of one of the next support groups we have. There will be either patients who've recovered um, or experts or specialists uh, to, to run um, some of the dialogue and some of the conversation on these as well. So it's a really safe space. Yes. And a, an yep. informative space. And how do people find this space? Yeah, so my website is a great place to, to find it. Uh, www.allthews.thepelvicpainclinic.co.uk. Um, there's treatments on there, there's resources, uh, there's lots of articles based on um, contemporary, uh, contemporaneous research, up to date research, and there's information on there about the support groups as well. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to call to a close now because we've, we've had a quite a good chat there. We're both yeah. getting hungry. Yeah. Time for another pint. Um, so thank you for listening if you've listened so far. Um, please spread the word, share um, this message, share the video wide so that we can um, really start getting some momentum around the conversation around mm -hmm. men's health. Mm -hmm. It isn't just about prostate cancer. Yep. We've broken that taboo. That's great. You know, the Ten years ago. taboo is gone. Mm, but now we need to start talking about that men get pain too and that it's um, okay to talk about it and it's something that we can treat. Um, underneath at the bottom here somewhere there will be a um, newsletter sign up so if you're interested in hearing more about these talks that I do um, sign up for the newsletter and you'll just get something in your inbox I'm, I'm not that great with them so don't worry about getting loads of spam um, they'll be every now and then when new things come out and uh, I think that's all any other resources that I've mentioned will be underneath this I'll try and put as, as many as I can find there's some good couple of websites and things coming up mm -hmm. So, thank you very much to Carl, um, it's been thank an absolute too. pleasure, mm -hmm. it always, um, it, it gives me such joy when um, experts in the field share, because as I always say, it's how we all build and gain knowledge, um, is when we're, we're open and honest with each other and share mm -hmm. our practice, and I'm sure this will not be the last chat that we have, because oh, I've already right. got more things that I want to talk to you about, yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, so thank you for coming on today. Pleasure, thank you very much for having me, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you again soon. Take bye. care, bye bye.